Okay, before we get into the specifics in terms of the attributes and the key ingredients of a research hypothesis, and we'll throw in a couple of examples at the end, let's do a bit of background work. A hypothesis is derived from the Greek word to suppose. And what we're talking about is a tentative explanation of the relationship between two variables, the IV and the DV. It's like an educated guess. And based on further testing, where we generate some descriptive and inferential statistics, we can either support or reject that educated guess that we made. The attributes of a hypothesis, it's got to be testable. So saying statements such as, a blue sky is beautiful, Katy Perry's a great singer, Roger um, Federer has a majestic forehand, etc. These are statements that aren't testable, not scientifically anyway. So therefore, we can't convert them into a hypothesis. We've got to make a prediction, and our prediction must be verifiable or falsifiable in the event of a insignificant um, result where we have a p-value over 0.05. So the four key ingredients of a hypothesis, we've got to identify a population. Typically, in a VC scenario, that's going to be students from a certain secondary college or university. In the case of experiments on mental health patients, maybe it's people who've been diagnosed with depression or schizophrenia or an anxiety disorder and so on. Second ingredient is the IV, the independent variable, which is the one we manipulate. So for instance, let's say we want to do an experiment on the effectiveness of meditation on stress levels of VC students. What we're going to do is going to get a group of students and we're going to get half of them to meditate on a regular basis and the other half, they're not going to meditate. So what we're manipulating is students either meditating or not. The DV, that's the one we measure, and it's dependent on the manipulation of the independent variable. So we're going to measure student anxiety levels after they've done their program of either meditating or not then we must make a prediction. And again, I'll reinforce these shortly with a couple of examples. After we've created our research hypothesis, we need to operationalize the IV and the DV. So this is sort of the last thing you do in your introduction of your ERA. So what we're doing is specifying exactly how the IV is manipulated. So just saying meditation, that's very broad on its own. And that's fine in the research hypothesis. But after that, we've got to specify how we're going to do it. So what we might say is that our VC students are going to meditate for 10 weeks, an entire term, doing three one-hour sessions per week. And the other group, our control group, well, they're not going to meditate at all. And then we're going to specify exactly how we're going to measure the DV. So what we might do is before the experiment, we might get the students to do a standard anxiety test, and you can get a bunch of them on the internet. And then we're going to get them to do a similar test at the end of the experiment, at the end of that 10 weeks, and we're going to compare the scores both pre- and post-experiment. So our DV in that case is going to be the change in their scores, in the anxiety scores out of 100 on the blah, blah, blah test, etc. Let's go through a couple of examples. Now, a lot of schools did this as their first um, ERA SAC for the year back in second term. Um, so we're looking at this, the impact of a delay on the serial position effect. So just saying that the delay affects the serial position effect, that's a statement, but in its current form, it's not testable. So let, let's work on our four ingredients. For simplification, let's just make our population VC students. Our IV is what we're going to manipulate. We're going to get half our class to recall the words immediately after they're read out, and the other half, they're going to recall them after a brief delay. The DV is going to be basically the percentage recall of the last few items on the serial list. We're not going to worry about the primacy effect. And the prediction is the delay is going to reduce the recency effect. So put all those together, and it doesn't really matter the order. What I'm looking for as an assessor is that the students have ticked off those four things. They've got their population, IV, DV, and the prediction. So the, re the v VC students will have a lower recall rate, that should be, not rare, of latter words on a serial list compared to the students who recalled the words immediately. So again, check it before you, you finish off with this. Have you got your population? Yep, there it is, VC students. Have I made a prediction? Yes, they're going to have a, a lower recall rate, the delayed group. Where's my IV? I've got two groups. I've got students who are going to recall them immediately, and I've got students who are doing it after delay. 
And where's my measurement, my DV? Well, we'll we've mentioned the words um, recall rate, even though I can't spell it there. Then we're going to operationalize the IV. So how exactly are we going to manipulate it? Well, we're going to get you to recall 15 words immediately after I finish reading them out or after a one minute delay. And during that one minute delay, we're going to create a bit of an interference. And this is what I did with my students when we experimented on them is my experimental group, they're going to count backwards by sevens from 500 so they can't use maintenance rehearsals. So that's specifying exactly how we're manipulating it. You're either recalling the words immediately or you're doing it after the one minute delay with the interference task and we're specifying what that interference task was. So then the DV is going to be the recall rate of those last five words on that serial list of 15 words. All right, here's another example. Memory pills, you can buy these in the chemist. So the theory is these work. Again, in its current form, that's not testable. So let's narrow it down a bit. Our population, due to um, minors, we don't want to work with them. Let, let's have a, let's test these on university students. So our IV is we're going to get a bunch of university students and we're going to get some of them, half of them, to take the memory pills and we're going to get the other half to take placebos. We're going to use some deception. The ethics committee, they're going to give us the thumbs up, let's presume. So the DV is going to be their improvement in memory, i.e. from before they took them until after they took them. The prediction is that students who take the pills, they're going to have a more improved memory performance than the students who don't. Put all those together and our hypothesis, which is broad, university students who take memory pills will have more improvement in their memory than students who take the placebos, the fake ones. The IV, the operationalized IV, we've got to specify. So we're going to make our experimental group take one of these pills for every day of a semester, which might last 90 days. And our control group, they're just going to have a daily placebo. And again, this is a single blind experiment because we're eliminating the placebo effect. The operationalized DV is we need to have a scoring system where we can compare the change. So I've made this up, but let's say there's a Stanford Binet memory test that we can source on the, on the web. We test everyone before the 90-day trial, and then we test them after the 90-day trial. And our, our basically our DV is the improvement or the change in the score out of 100 on that test. So I hope this has been of use.